Okay, so my name is Rippy. It's um, very odd. I had nothing to do with it, my parents, <laughs> but like you rip a piece of paper. Um, uh, this topic I am extremely um, passionate about, and I tried to think about what the audience might want to hear. So um, I tended to go a little more towards getting um, us out in the community doing stuff versus uh, what a horticultural therapist might do. But I want to tie in some suggestions on that and uh, share information. So um, I'd encourage you as we talk, uh, any questions or comments or things you want to add, please feel free to do that. Um, but who I am. So I'm a master gardener and um, sit, went through a class in 2014. And um, my profession, I'm a speech therapist who has uh, worked with primarily adults, uh, neurogenic acquired things, uh, and difficulties, stroke, head injury, head and neck cancer, things like that. Um, and my interactions with my patients who stopped gardening because they had a life altering event made me extremely sad and scared because I was like, you know, something eventually is going to happen to me and I want to still want to be able to garden. So that led me to looking into how to do a uh, group with individuals who have disabilities in a gardening setting and led me to the Master Gardeners because we have a program in, uh, that's entitled Therapeutic Horticulture. So um, basically what that program is about is going out into our community different settings, uh, whether it's residential, day programs, uh, schools with special populations, that kind of thing. And we um, do gardening related tasks, whether it's a full on vegetable garden, whether it's indoor gardening projects, uh, where somebody who is, uh, has to stay inside more, where they can um, actually get their, still get their hands dirty and um, reminisce and think about um, gardening things that they've uh, done over the past and share their their knowledge. So um, that um, said, the topic and what I was hoping to accomplish with this program was um, to enable you to get the therapeutic benefit from gardening throughout your life, no matter what, and then hopefully enable you to share that and, and do that with other people that you come in contact with. So who in here has either heard or said, oh, gardening is so therapeutic, gardening is my therapy. <laughs> so I just met a new neighbor uh, yesterday, moved in, and she's out there picking, picking weeds off of her driveway. And uh, I went up and introduced myself, and I said, you've been out here working. She doesn't know me at all. And she's like, uh, I've been out, you're out here working hard. And she said, yeah, it's so therapeutic. And I was like, I was like we need to talk. <laughs> um, so we know, uh, and really through the ages, people have known that gardening is therapeutic. Um, I see, and uh, I, I recognize your face up in the front row of knitting. What's your name? Gail. Gail. Gail is knitting. And anybody who does those kind of things a busy hands is a restful mind so doing something like that can just open your mind up to recover from trauma to rest from a stressful day so the the activities that we do in gardening can be so um, uh, mindless that open your mind to be mindful um, weeding weeding and who in here has figured out, you know, some of your life problems while you've been out in the yard? So everybody has their passion. My husband figures those kind of things out while he's fishing. But there are a lot of people who figure out that they like gardening and they didn't even know it. So, all right. Um, so what the three things I'm hoping to accomplish today is, um, talk about what is gardenability, what are our challenges in that term, and how to make gardening and the um, gardens that we go to accessible. Okay. So um, just a disclaimer, I made the word up. There is no word gardenability in the dictionary. I think there should be. If you Google it and search, you'll find there's an um, a online retailer. 
And guess what they sell? <laughs> Stuff that enables you to garden. So for me, I think of gardenability as a twofold. One is it's about the garden itself being, having the ability for people, all people, to come and engage in it. And then the other aspect of it would be the gardener's ability. So we have the, the place and the person, and we want to make everything gardenable. Um, and this is no matter the person's age, physical, mental state, or where they happen to live. Um, so we go through different stages and phases in life, the, the stages being the normal development, and the phases being those more unexpected or not necessarily normal setbacks. Um, sometimes they're sem temporary and sometimes they're permanent. Um, with regards to that, my um, passion is to not let those, I have a little point, to not let these keep you from doing gardening or anything. Um, just because your life is altered doesn't mean that you can't be who you are. Um, so what I want to do is kind of briefly go through um, stages and what um, gardening people in those stages kind of uh, tend to need. There's going to be stuff I miss, and if anybody can think of something real blaring and wants to share it, please do. But basically, um, when we start with the stage of kids, uh, there's a lot of things kids need, but as far as physically for the garden, they need plenty of room between plants, plenty of space so that you're not yelling at them for stepping on plants and doing things. They also need clear parameters. So if um, you have some a child out there watering the grass, uh, watering the garden, they're not you know spraying everywhere. You give them a clear idea of what you expect of them. Um, tweens, so the eight to twelve year olds, they want it fun, but they also want positive interactions with adults. They still like to hang out with us. Um, which is really cool. They particularly like to hang out with us when we're not their parents. So you can have a huge impact on, uh, and I'm just calling tweens because it's easier, but that age, and it'd be very little effort. In fact, I'm going to ask um, Rich to share some things with us after we go through a couple things, but he was saying how he's had that with the community garden he worked um, The teenagers, um, and again, if they're not yours, it's a whole different story. But they like fun social interactions, um, mainly with their peers. So you'll get a, a lot of times um, groups, unless it's some kind of um, punishment <coughs> service that somebody has to do to come work at a garden you may be involved with, um, usually it's a group. Uh, and they have all kinds of organizations in school and outside of school that require volunteering hours. And I have mixed emotions on that. I think it's good, but at the same time, I want people to come garden and work in a garden because they want to. So you can instill this possible uh, life passion with somebody who wasn't expecting it when you are interacting with volunteers. So another thing with that too is if you are in, involved with a community garden, you know, outside of your yard, teenagers will work for free. Boy Scouts can build amazing things, and really, all you need to do is ask. And it may be that it's not even something you're really interacting with. Maybe it's your aunt or your mother or somebody you know um, is living in a certain situation and they could use a ramp to be able to get to their garden to make it more accessible. They take on projects like that, too. Um, Okay, young adults um, tend to need and want a sense of community. So a lot of times they'll be involved in, um, in community gardens and be involved in um, a thing where they can feel a part of a group. Um, they tend to um, need to or hopefully need to save money. Um, and they are limited on space. So if you can target those ideas or those points, you can pull them in. Um, young adults with kids, um, they tend to need time and energy, and we're going to talk about some, um, some tips on how to deal with these um, challenges. Uh, Middle-aged adults uh, tend to want their work and their efforts to have meaning, and whether it's self-meeting or to their family or to the community. Um, a lot of times you'll find them uh, more um, 
contemplative as far as wanting to go to gardens where they can sit, like the Arboretum, and really just to relax, um, spend time with their family, or um, provide, feel like they really brought something to the table for their community. Um, older adults, and this is the one that I tend to uh, gravitate personally towards more um, in connecting with, is just because we all are hopeful to get to that stage in our life. Um, and so just the stage of getting old has its own uh, challenges, but then if you add in an unexpected phase on top of that, it's, it can be just, it can devastate you. But um, the, they need to have some decreased effort uh, just because of physically uh, or health issues. They need more support, uh, whether it be physical or emotional, to get out there and do stuff. They tend to have um, space issues. Um, they either don't have the space or they have too much space. And it's too much to handle. Um, and then a big thing is um, social connections. So even people who are not very social need that human contact. So um, there's some data out on uh, people who've had strokes and specifically have um, a language or communication disorder called aphasia. 90% of those people have depression, clinical depression. And it's, uh, it's because of the isolation. And for them, a lot of it has to do with the language and the communication disconnect. But it also translates into people not being able to share something with somebody that they enjoy. All right. Um, so before we get into like some strategies to hopefully you guys carry over to your life, or um, if you want to go out and do some work and provide a therapeutic situation for other people, I was hoping y'all could share some. Um, insight into your experiences with what we've talked about, whether it be uh, kids on up to older adults. Rich. I'm Rich Woynich. I'm a master gardener also. I've worked with Griffey on some stuff. Um, I run a community garden over in Cary, and we've experienced a lot of this. Um, we were at uh, outreach from a church, but we really wanted to reach out to the community. So we're in the process of actually closing the garden down, but when we reflect on kind of what the garden did, it wasn't the produce, it wasn't the um, learning about gardening that really was successful, it was the community that we built, right? It's the, the young mother who's in, uh, struggling to figure out how to deal with life as she's a single mother. It's the older retired guy who wanted somebody to talk to during the day. The family that is looking to raise their middle age or high school age kids to give back to the community. Those are the things that we built as part of our garden. And so a lot of the things Rippy has here absolutely reflected in things like community gardens and that community building. And for the various ages too. We've got everything from little toddlers in the garden that love pulling up carrots to, you know, older retired people that, you know, just, you know, come and look and come sit and look at the garden. Hi, I'm Robin, and a couple of years, I'm also a master gardener. Uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the other master gardeners and myself set up um, a garden club at one of the senior centers in Wendell. And over time, um, I guess we worked with them for a couple of years, and one of the cool things that happened was they needed raised beds, because obviously they couldn't be down. These were all senior citizens, and, and we didn't have a place for them to do in the ground gardening one of the other senior centers actually built the raised beds for them. So it was, it was a really nice synergy between two senior groups helping each other. But by the end of the second year, they had, I think, four or five raised gardening uh, vegetable beds that they were reaping a lot of benefit from. But then they expanded and they did flowers all in front of the community center. And it was absolutely gorgeous. So it started out as just no landscaping at all. And then over the period, and then they took it all over by themselves. So um, they, they got a lot, of, um, a lot of good feelings from seeing what they were able to create all by themselves. It was very productive. Did anybody else have something to share? Yeah, I'm um, also an acid gardener. I did not plant these guys in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. No, for sure. Um, 
Um, and I work with a senior citizen center, and we spend a, two or three hours. One group is a, is in supportive living, so they are really people who are not able to function on their own, and they're incredible. I mean, you know, three or four of them will go to sleep while you're talking, but then there will be those that are in this environment and starve for new information, stimulation, and attention. And they kept us out for about 30 or 40 minutes asking questions. We did one on bees. Now, you know, they're probably never going to step on a bee again in their life. But they couldn't <laughs> wait to ask questions about, about something interesting new. Um, you know, it was very, very rewarding because they really perked up. Yeah. I'm backwards on many things. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on a farm and I said, I will never do anything more with plants in my life. Animals are for me, humans are for me. Can y'all hear her? <laughs> and so she's backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was employed by the Department of Community Medicine at Georgetown University. And my supervisor indicated, we have a real problem. There are a number of men who have suffered serious heart attacks. And they're home, and their wives are out working, and they're very depressed. You grew up on a farm. I wouldn't you take the master gardening class? <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> And I found that very interesting. I was a member of a group um, in Fairfax County, Virginia. And so I developed this program for nurses to teach. But of course, I had to teach it to the nurses. And it became one of the more successful um, programs just to get the men to think they could do something. I had taught a cooking class to the men before. So there was sort of an inroad in this uh, planting lettuce seeds, very simple things. But um, it changed, in some part, the men's lives. Um, the next thing I got involved with uh, was in Columbus, Ohio. And we did have a person that, in Chad McCarthy that was trained in hortotherapy. And I worked with the differently abled young adults. Found that very, very rewarding. You ready to get back into it? <laughs> <laughs> Come join us. I know. Um, let's, so, let's say I'm trying to scale down. Simplify your life, yeah. Um, Right. Well, when uh, your community garden closes or something changes in your life and you want to take on something new, it's a very worthwhile um, thing. I just hope there's somebody out there when I need it um, to do these things. <laughs> so one thing I do want to point out, and I'll uh, go back if there's anybody else who wants to share something. Um, but uh, Marilyn said something about getting the guys, the individuals who've had heart attacks to... Um, and I can't remember your exact words, but <clears throat> that they felt like they could do something or knowing they could do something. Um, and I'm somebody who likes to pat myself on the back and that I, um, I, I'm a therapist and I want to enable people to do things that they think they can't do or they have had a change that they can't do. But I have one of our um, Master Gardener Therapeutic Sites is a group that meets out of the um, Holly Springs Food Cupboard. Um, garden and that garden produces on average um, one ton of fresh produce a year and I have four uh, it varies from four to seven uh, individuals that come uh, once a week through um, most of the year not the dead heat of the summer we don't do it but um, they <clears throat> they are actually um, Holly Springs food cover volunteers they're signed up they are volunteers through them and I just thought, I just want them, you know, to, to communicate and interact in a garden setting. And um, I wasn't expecting a lot of work out of them. I was thinking, you know, we're, it's going to be not very productive. These guys work their tails off 
and are so proud of it. 90% of the plants that go in the garden that are uh, uh, transplanted in the garden, not the seeds that go in and um, not some uh, transplant or plant that's been bought and brought in or donated, but the ones that we actually propagate and grow from seed, 90% of those, these four to seven people have grown. And it's amazing. And we have a plant sale once a uh, year in the spring where they sell some of those plants to then support themselves in their efforts in that garden. And it just it, to say that I wanted to um, just get them engaged in something, these guys are producers. And um, they have some meaning and purpose in life that they weren't expecting. You were going to uh, add something? I, I work with people with disabilities, um, which includes you know, not just people in wheelchairs, but also people with heart, heart disease, COPD. Um, I guess my experience is a little different in that it's not so much a group. Uh, the need that I see isn't so much for group gardening, but an individual can gain satisfaction, come out of depression, get some meaning to wake up, um, to just gardening at his house or her house. Um, and that is difficult because the clientele I work with are typically very poor. Um, they're all over North Carolina, but I cover the counties like Franklin and Moore and Johnston. Um, not Wake, I mean, I cover Wake County, but you know, yeah, there's a lot of counties out there where people live very isolated lives or at the age they don't have many family members. And I can see they, they want a garden about one out of every ten and it's like I know what they need it's just it takes a lot to do. they need to raise beds you know they need special tools they need someone to go out there and help them um, and so uh, yeah I think there's I think the group the group and the community gardens are great but I think there's also a need for the individual that's how I garden personally although you know I was up here so I enjoy the community too but well, I'm hoping um, that some of the stuff we touch on um, that our um, Master Garden Therapeutic Horticulture Program has implemented and things that I know of um, just being involved with uh, horticultural therapists um, that I've learned I um, would love to, sh to share and you guys talk about how you can implement it if you have a suggestion on how, what's your name? I'm Ray. Ray. How Ray can translate this into impacting these lives, um, these people's lives. Because even um, what I was talking about with the social interaction, I think what I got from you is that these people can lift their spirits by having social interaction with plants. Yeah. Just like we do with pets. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I mean, it, sometimes I don't want to get out of bed sometimes and you know what will get me out? Oh, my plants need me. <laughs> Not my kids anymore, but my plants need me. Um, so, Ray, what I hope is some of these things we can do, we can say you it hopefully would be something to translate and to use with that. Um, I will say I, I have logged 17 hours, 17 years as a master gardener. And so I would challenge you to come back. You're hired. You don't have to sell yourself anymore. All right. So, um, Let's touch on those phases, um, and I think hopefully from my graphics there you can you you get what I'm talking about. Um, and again, these can be things that are temporary, or and show up all of a sudden, or things that are have been building for a while, and things that could be going away, or things that are going to be a chronic problem for you. So. Um, these are, and I think I covered some body, major body parts. I kind of <laughs> thought about what my body feels like and where it hurts. And um, for gardeners, it tends to be those areas, the back, knees, hips, shoulders, elbows, um, arthritis and gripping things, that kind of stuff. Um, did I leave any major body parts out? <laughs> um, and then we have the issues what like Marilyn was talking about with the uh, individuals with heart problems, stroke, uh, any kind of physical or uh, disability or emotional disability or mental disability. Um, so what, with the recovery, um, you can either end up being um, 
those things you can read. Um, but the main thing would be um, changes in priorities and changes in living state in living situations um, and your ability to move around like you used to do. So if somebody has a stroke and I, none of you guys have that nasty thing happen, but your garden right now, if you were not able to move around like you could today, and you wake up tomorrow and you can't, are you going to be able to go out into your garden and do what you wake up and take care of your plants? Um, so I was listening to um, Rich talk about uh, a, a new um, job he's working on, and where he's uh, and I'm probably not doing it justice, but he's laying down. So in Holly Springs, we have um, team coming in and laying down cables and networky stuff all over the place, mm -hmm. and they are ripping up everything. But if you pl if they had planned ahead, if they had had to. A crystal ball and known all right one day we're gonna have this great wire that we're gonna want everywhere which they can't do that so they have to go back and rip it up but we do have a crystal ball of possibilities that could come into our lives whether it's um, a disability whether it's uh, grandkids whether it's um, you start a, a group in your neighborhood a garden club it's you can kind of think along the lines of what could my life be like and how can I plan ahead? How can I not have to rip up everything? And the good news is, is you can do things uh, retrospectively um, and then going forward. Since gardeners are always um, have a work, their garden is always a work in progress, you just start um, thinking that way in the future. Um, and there's a term, uh, universal design. If um, Are people familiar with that? term somewhat kind of maybe so basically it's um, to me I just think of the um, so the ADA is the American Disabilities Act to me I think it's kind of that but for everybody so it's not that you need a wheelchair ramp to get in this building it's that you the d architect and the people that designed it thought beforehand to put it into the landscape so it's not an ugly you know, ramp that somebody's going to drive by and go, oh, all I see, I don't see the pretty roses, I see that ramp. So if you have an opportunity, if you're redoing your deck or you're redoing something that you can think about it as a more aesthetic way and that uh, adds value to your property, um, it enables you to see people in your environment that you might not be able to. Like right now, I have <clears throat> some gardeners who come over to my house and we do stuff and some of them are um, uh, physical disabilities and it is a struggle for them to get into my bathroom which is going to change because I'm going to move and build a universally designed house. Um, so um, one thing I can recommend, <clears throat> so as gardeners either you or somebody in your life is experiencing one of these phases, these unexpected nasty things, you, um, good medical resources and allies who appreciate val the therapeutic value of um, gardening. Uh, unfortunately, but at the same time, fortunately, therapeutic horticulture and uh, horticultural therapists are, are, has not been a um, real recognized profession. They are starting to really grow. They are developing um, certification processes and recognitions of national um, organizations who oversees them. Um, but you can get this therapeutic value from other allied health people. You have a speech therapist who likes to garden, um, activities directors at uh, assisted living homes, um, occupational therapist, but if you think about, um, uh, so those are like the main therapies. So what are some other therapies that y'all have heard of or know of besides like physical therapy? Diane? Well, can I just ask you a question? Uh-huh. Can you distinguish between therapeutic horticulture and horticultural therapy? Yeah. I, is there a difference? There is. Okay. So um, there is, as long, if, if it's your profession, then there is a difference. So, um, 
a horticultural therapist is like a speech therapist, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a respiratory therapist. And what distinguishes them is that they set goals and they uh, document and they uh, very directed activities. Um, and uh, there are volunteer horticultural therapists, but typically it's a job um, for the, and we call, in the Master Gardeners, we call our program horticultural therapy, and we do that on purpose because we are not horticultural therapists. We are not certified, we are not um, trained. Now the training is, right now, is pretty out there. You can um, have it be registered within the American Horticultural Therapy Association, or you can not. Uh, they, um, the North Carolina Botanical Gardens in Chapel Hill is hoping to start a um, training certification class, but it won't be recognized by the ATHA at this point. But um, you, so you can go to that class and get certified and feel confident that you kind of know what you're doing. Um, and, and provide services. So we are like the unofficial, um, we are all hort uh, therapeutic horticulture providers. If you enable somebody to get some benefit from their well-being by interacting with plants, we are a horticultural uh, therapy. Did that answer? Okay. Uh -huh. This isn't quite talking about, but kind of related. I used to be a work manager, and so I used to be a what? Workers' compensation uh -huh. manager, so I would deal with people after injuries. And after I had been doing it for quite a while, I'd start working more with how do we prevent injuries, you know, instead of after. And one of the things I have found that's really, really helpful is yoga. Um, so I just have to say that, like, as a preventative thing of some of, now some injuries, of course, you can't prevent. But um, I see the two parallel, and so I get into a lot of gardening discussion with people in yoga classes because it makes you very aware of posture, of what to do, what not to do. Like, yeah, I'm out there, if I'm bent over, then I'm like out there stretching the other way, you know, in my garden. So I just wanted to mention That's that. That's awesome thing to call out, and I believe that the Arboretum has yoga yes. in the garden. Exactly. Our summer one just ended. But we're resuming in September and we're offering it on Mondays and Wednesdays. Basic on Mondays and a little more specialized one on Wednesdays. That'd be awesome. Come join us. Yeah. Um, that, on here? that is not on there. It's late breaking, which is why you always have to change. And uh, she wasn't supposed to be here in September when I was printed, but she's changed. Did you know it in her hour? Yes, we did. Yes. So um, I was trying to see if this next slide um, dealt with um, like the recommendation there with the yoga. Um, there is one, uh, hopefully, that if I don't keep running my mouth off um, script here, we'll get to. Um, but I did want to talk about the challenges and how we can hopefully overcome some of those challenges we talked about and what Ray brought up about um, his individuals he's dealing with. So actually, this did not. Okay, so dealing with injuries, so the preventative measures are always the first thing, and yoga being a huge thing. And I, in a former life, was a big runner, and I did not embrace stretching. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't, I don't need to stretch. I can go out there and run. I wish I had stretched, and I wish I'd been stretching my whole life. And now, before I go out and garden, I have to stretch, because my bursitis in my hip and my lower back. You, you need, we need to be proactive. Um, also, exercise with gardening in mind to build strength and know, is it, do I always have trouble with my shoulder? Okay, where do I need to strengthen it up? And if you don't feel confident knowing that, you can go to um, a physical therapist and you don't even have to I shouldn't say it like that. You don't have to have a physician's order to get physical therapy. It's a good thing to consult your physician, but if it's that whole process is too overwhelming, you can walk into a physical therapy office and say, 
I'm a gardener, I'm having trouble with this, and they'll, they can treat you. Um, and file things through Medicare, Medicaid, and insurance stuff. Um, so uh, that's a reactive measure if you start to feel something happening. But they can come up with an exercise routine that helps you get out of that um, difficulty that you can kind of stick in a basket, you know, under your desk, and then when it starts flaring up again, pull it back out. Because if we let it go, then it's just going to be chronic. Um, we all get that. <coughs> um, so life-altering things, and I talked about the um, prevalence of depression, uh, and Ray mentioned, is it Ray? Right. Ray mentioned that with his individuals out in rural areas, um, you, you, people have to refuse to give up their passions. If it's knitting and you have lost use of one hand, that doesn't mean you can't knit. It means you have to be creative and you have to come up with a way to keep your passions and your interests alive. There's a um, term, uh, compensatory strategies. So basically, um, I want a cup of coffee, but there are no cups back there, and I need a cup of coffee. So I'm going to figure out another way to hold a cup of coffee. I wouldn't go to this extreme, but I could empty out one of those flower pots and use a flower pot. Um, I could come over to the sink and stop it up and put a little bit of coffee in there, and I could drink it with a spoon. So that's extreme, but that is a strategy. And other things in life that are normal that you might see. Um, there's a gentleman in the back with a cane, and that's a compensatory strategy. You, you can't walk that well or your balance is off. You use something to help you. Same thing with gardening and what we uh, talking about, the adaptive equipment and things to enable somebody to do that. There is, you could spend a lot of money on gardening in general, but then you can topple it over the the extreme when you have to put in adaptive equipment. But don't give up because if you look and you, the online resources of just going out there and saying, you know, if you have um, arthritis and seeing what kind of gardening tools there are for that, you look at it and you're like, oh, it's got a lot of foam around it. And you're like, I know where to get foam. And, you know, you attach it, glue it to the thing or have a family member help you. Don't give up. Just figure out a way to do it. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's talk about some of the, um, the challenges and how we overcome them. So um, time, not enough time. So this can't be stressed enough. You need to garden smart. You need to know what you're doing. You need to have a plan of what you want to accomplish. Um, the soil. Don't put a plant in until you know if the soil is what it needs to be to grow it because if it's not you're going to be having a battle with this all the time and if you want to be able to just go out there and spend a little bit of time taking care of them you have to do the right stuff along the way and um, there are plenty of other master gardeners who can uh, preach to you on this it's not really my thing but um, the soil testing the right plant in the right spot uh, vegetable gardening crop rotation all that kind of good stuff um, but I do have two that I, I am uh, really passionate about, and it's a maintenance calendar and a garden journal. <clears throat> so to save yourself time, know what you need to do and when you do it. So if it's to look for bugs at a certain time, don't know that ahead of time. And so you can do it and be on top of it. And a garden journal, that's where you can put, I screwed up, I didn't look for the white flies when I was supposed to. And so next year I open up you know, August, and I look at what I have written down and what I did and what went well and what didn't. And it can be as elaborate and creative as you want it to be, or it can be a note to yourself on your cell phone, or on a scrap of piece of paper that you drop into a, a manila envelope. Just a way to capture that so that our brains don't have to remember all that stuff. <clears throat> all right, so not enough space. Um, and I'm going to kind of jump ahead with this. There's another slide that kind of deals with um, more accessible gardening um, containers and beds. Um, so I'll kind of talk about those a little bit when I do look at these pictures. But <coughs> so I thought that was clever. You know, think outside the box, think outside the pot. Um, 
be creative and, and uh, look at things differently. But the um, research-based master gardener in me says, make sure you know how to take care of a plant. If you're planting something in a container, make sure you have the information you need to successfully grow something in a planter. What they need water-wise, what it needs uh, fertilization, depth of growing, that kind of thing. Which, if you call the master gardener office and say, I'm trying to grow this plant in a container that's this deep, then hopefully we can guide it. And there's some cards, business cards in the back that have our um, email and phone numbers on them. <clears throat> okay, so I am on a five gallon bucket brigade. Uh, five gallon buckets are, to me, are turning out to be the most fabulous thing. And actually, right when you were talking about it, I was like, oh my gosh, you need some buckets? <laughs> so um, up here, I call this the redneck bucket garden. And you see how basic it is? Uh, there's another picture that I just ran out of room, but he just had those on his driveway. He had his tomato plants, he lined them up on the driveway. Um, again, uh, plant selection is key, um, but we have all kinds of information on what plants are good to grow in bucket or in containers. And then specifically, there's more research coming out of um, universities about buckets specifically. Um, if you contact the master gardeners, I have information if you want to do this, like what kind of the drainage holes and what to um, put in the bucket along with soil. But you can make them pretty. You can paint them. Uh, we have a program, and Donna's not here, we have a program uh, through our group that's out of uh, the Garner High School, uh, the special ed class, and it's a group of um, students who are on the autism spectrum disorder. And uh, if, if you know about some of the challenges that uh, people with autism have, personal space is a big deal. Um, and this enabled them, and I have a picture of them with it in a minute, but this enabled them to be able to take the buck, ah! this enabled them to be able to have the bucket in a, a garden that they could work together on, or if we had something that they needed a little more space, or they, one particular student needed more space, you take the bucket out and let them work at it, and you can do it at a table. So, Talking about somebody who is inside, and I'm not uh, suggesting, Gray, that you do this, but they can work on a bucket garden, and then you, somebody else can take care of it if they aren't able to do that. Um, what they need to be able to do is get it to the sun and make sure it has the right water. So if you can enable somebody to do that, then you're good. Um, but you've got to educate them. Um, so, some other um, ideas, uh, bends, um, I think that's all pretty self-explanatory there. Uh, just other containers. So look at things, and recycling right now is a big deal. So um, as far as like uh, decorating with and incorporating old things, so you're not, it's not, I think probably, you know, before you'd see tires out in the yard and you might go, oh, yeah. now do you see somebody planting something in a tower of tires, you're like, wow, look at them, they used that. They have not wasted that resource. And things like, you can find things that are um, low cost um, and don't have, take a lot of um, building skills. But if you have somebody who may be interested in, oh, I'm not very good with this with um, like a more detail. So this is five gallon drums. Um, you always, and I should have said this with the buckets, you always want to make sure of what has been in the bucket. Um, so you can buy five gallon buckets or smaller, two gallon buckets, one gallon buckets at home improvement stores and they have food grade. You can also go to um, a restaurant and ask them, do you have any leftover five gallon buckets? Because tons of, uh, food, big buckets of pickles and mayonnaise and all kinds of stuff. We used containers that had held frosting. Uh, and we went to every grocery store that frosted cakes. And they came, some of them short and dumpy, 
and some of them tall and it made a really versatile type of garden. Yeah. And you can, uh, those kind of things, you can paint them and make them look uh, prettier. Um, so these are some other things that I've just um, come across. I have not done any of these, and the thing that I am hesitant about even sharing these is, is the size. So you need to make sure it's something that can, the roots and the plant can grow in it <coughs> um, and thrive and you can meet its needs. Of these examples right here, I think probably this palette is a, is a good one. Um, just to lift it up a little bit. Um, and I, I got back to my bucket thing. So if you think about the bucket, so uh, talking about um, access to being able to bend over or whatever. Uh, one of my hopeful plans is to build a, um, a stand where the, it's a post and it has hooks off of it, and then we hang potentially four, up to four buckets off of it on chains or on pulleys so that the individuals can sit. Uh, if it's a kid, you could take it off the chain and they could sit on the floor and roll around and do whatever they want to do while they're working in it. You could, um, if it's somebody who is having a problem with their back, they could set it on a table or they could sit next to it and you lower the height to whatever it needs to be. Um, you get the point. Um, but because containers can allow somebody with a disability or a challenge to be able to garden. <clears throat> um, ideas for vertical gardening. Uh, again, you want to be sure you're uh, cognizant of what the recommendations are to successfully grow in containers. If you're already growing uh, things in pots, so just putting them together like this can make it easier for you to get to or somebody else to get to or if you are tight on space. Um, okay, conserving energy and effort. Um, just using uh, anything to make it uh, easier on you. And searching online uh, through Google or Pinterest, things like that, you can see lots of things. Like this uh, bucket thing right here, came, I found off of Amazon, but um, I have a laundry basket that I can totally use for something like this. So you don't have to go and buy something new. Um, down here is uh, if, like uh, using a prefab fence as a garden trellis. So things that you wouldn't normally think of, but if you have limited resources of being able to build something, you can use something else. Um, recently I put a um, chair on an enclosed garden bed uh, my husband wasn't willing to build me a door, so um, I got a panel of the railing on the deck and inverted it this way and put a handle on it because I was going to have this garden bed and I needed a door. Um, <clears throat> anything that you can think of to make things easier on you. Uh, I kind of I like this idea um, and you can do that with anything so they put whatever was heavy on a uh, cookie sheet pizza pan and then pulled it you can do that with um, anything a tarp tie strings on it and, and drag it um, pull it however you want to do it uh, things like the bottom picture here with the uh, wheels on the caster you can um, just make it make it work if you're having uh, dexterity problems arthritis or fine motor control <clears throat> um, use things that can make putting seeds in the ground easier. If your vision is challenged, you put them on, mark it, drill it out on a ruler. This is a specific ruler for that, but you can do it on any wooden ruler. <clears throat> Seed tapes. They're kind of expensive in uh, catalogs, but you can, uh, you can make them. We, I've made them with some groups, and it's toilet paper and water and flour. And um, you can contact the guard, uh, mass gardener office and I can send you stuff on it. Um, okay, not enough money. So gardening is expensive, but we all know how to make it less expensive. Um, take a propagation class, take a, uh, and learn how to be more um, successful. Volunteer, um, Lynn in the back, can I use you as an example? She volunteers here at the Arboretum and then also at um, Plant Delights. 
And when you volunteer in a lot of organizations, whether they advertise it uh, or not, if you're working in the garden and it has to be thinned out, a lot of times you're going to get to take some of that home. Um, and you learn a ton while you're doing it too. Um, join, a, if you're not in a garden club, join one. Encourage people to join one. Plant swaps, if you have, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a free plant sale. Um, one of the things I want to talk about though is this one down here. <clears throat> so if, if you ever ridden by somebody's house that you live my, near and you say, oh my gosh, they're, they have so many plants, but it just doesn't look like they are able to take care of it. And I can say this works because I've done it. You go to their door and you tell them that you um, see, you love irises and you see they have a whole bed of them. And uh, I would love to um, thin it out for you so yours are healthier and so I can have some in my yard. And they, they will give you the shovel and they will let you divide up their plants. Just let them know you know what you're doing. And, um, you can also make deals. I had a neighbor who had four kids and she um, didn't have much time to work in the yard. She wanted to. <clears throat> and this might be something that could translate into your guys in the rural area if they have a um, neighbor that they could work out a deal with. But my neighbor loved her yard, but she didn't have time. And um, so she, I would go mow her grass when I was out there mowing or weeding or doing whatever. And she, when she made dinner, on the days I did that, she made double and brought dinner over to me. And so we had, I had a cook and she had a gardener. <laughs> but you can make it work. <clears throat> um, as far as um, saving money, be creative. Um, you have things laying around. This is something that um, actually with, um, <clears throat> you have to stay on top of it with plant growing seeds out of um, toilet paper rolls. Um, they have to stay wet, and what I have found is planting them in another container. But then it, it's like those biodegradable pots you pay a lot of money for, you can just stick it in, in the garden. So for somebody who has a lot of trouble manipulating something, or not a lot of time, then it makes it a lot easier. Just um, loosen up, and it's good if it starts getting wet and starts breaking down a little bit. <clears throat> um, engaging a gardener. So, uh, Try and get something that's in, impactful for those people. If it's a kid, help them uh, with a pizza garden or a taco garden or a, a tea garden. You make it impactful for that person. It, the um, food cupboard that I was talking about, we are going to start, uh, here I go with buckets, but we're going to start giving out bucket gardens to the, some of the clients that come through so they take a garden home. And we are going to target what these people tend to eat, which we know because we're already growing it, but what of those things that we offer them do they really like? Uh, it can deal with ethnic backgrounds, age, that kind of stuff. <coughs> All right. So let's just look quickly at making things accessible. So these two pictures, I felt like, oh, they're pretty, but that they're not very accessible. A kid going in there or somebody with a cane or any kind of disability is going to have trouble working in this garden. So what do you do? Um, you know who's going to use your garden. And this is where I'm talking about current and potential. So not just somebody else, but yourself, your future self, what you can do. Make sure you're thinking about pathways. Um, if you have a pathway right now that's a little um, unfriendly, as you have more uh, issues as you age is going to be even more unfriendly. So do things to, to kind of change that. <clears throat> uh, you want to always think about the access to the plant. So if you're doing a, a, um, a raised bed, there's recommendations. And again, the, if you contact the Master Gardeners, we can give you those recommendations. But uh, they're based on the ADA standards of what people can reach at a standing height, at a sitting height. Um, actually, this is a perfect raised bed because I can get it here, and, but if it's against the wall, I only want one table. If it's a four-sided or two-sided, you can move around and two people could garden. <clears throat> All right, so talking about uh, more accessible beds, um, 
This one is basically somebody has a fence and they put, um, it's a little bigger than gutters, but if y'all have seen where people have used gutters to grow things, um, I, I struggle with that because the soil is like this much. So I have to water them like five times a day. But she's found something that's a little deeper and I don't know what it is, but find it and use it. Um, this is obviously a more planned out um, garden, uh, but that's not to say you can't do it. But the beds are the height um, for the raised bed, the pathway. Um, this might even be something for somebody with um, memory problems, orientation problems, visual problems. It's a circle. <clears throat> so if you do a garden and it's a circle and it's a loop, they can't get lost. So um, that's very uncomforting to certain populations. Um, this thing is probably my favorite. <clears throat> it's out of a company that's in France. <coughs> And you can't we can't order it <laughs> um, but basically they have implied all the purposes of what you want to have you want to have your maximum the most soil you can have to have success with plants but you want to ke still keep it accessible uh, this is a good variation of that these plants are going to struggle but maybe you plant something that uh, vines over and has shallow roots and again, uh, contact us, get suggestions for certain types of plants for certain situations. Put a uh, lattice work up at the back. Uh, these are two examples from our um, therapeutic court program. Uh, this is that group from the, um, the Garner High School and some of the kids interacting with it. Uh, this guy right here is one of my heroes. Uh, he, huh? It is. He, uh, he, he basically takes my um, ideas and, and makes them a reality. So he, um, he did help with this bed. There was another raised bed, and he's going to help me with those posts I was talking about. This down here is the group out of the Holly Springs Food Cover. Um, this is a high schooler um, built this based on what the clients. We sat down and collaborated uh, and came up with the plan. And that enabled them and showed them that they can carry this over into any situation they want to. But it, we knew that this, these individuals didn't need to nest, weren't in wheelchairs. <clears throat> so we did it. They needed support. They needed to be able to lean up against it. They needed to be able to, uh, if they have one hand that's more um, usable than the other, they need to have, be able to lean and have their tools on that side. <clears throat> then there's all these accessible garden tools. If you have a specific problem, if it's your, um, I can't wait to do this. This thing, so you're hedging, it's a, a, a support that you hook onto your back and it helps hold, it has a pulley system and it helps hold the, um, the hedger on there. Um, but there are things you guys have seen and they're coming out more and more. Um, there are some specific things that you can uh, do adaptations to and um, there are things that your uh, insurance may very well pay for, especially if you go to a physical therapist and say, I'm having trouble with, you know, or an occupational therapist, I'm having trouble with my elbow. I have, you know, a tendonitis, tennis elbow with, from gardening so much. And they open their little fancy catalog and they find something and it has a code and they can bill your uh, insurance or Medicare or Medicaid. But you can always do things on your own. That's it. <laughs> All right. and I know they have to have their lunch in here. Yeah, I, I had a comment. You yes. touched on this, uh, the need for planning ahead to make sure that watering is adequate uh, in containers. Uh huh. Because if you, uh, you mentioned you had to water the straw uh, several times a day. Yeah. Um, you need a, commitment from a neighbor if you're going to be away because I have plants, uh, tomatoes and peppers in pots and they have to be watered daily. If I went out of town for any reason for several days and uh, they didn't get watered, they'd be dead when I came back. And, um, well, I, it's a suggestion, so you said neighbor, so may, uh, hook up with a buddy or pay a kid to come down and water your stuff. They will think that's the greatest thing ever. Um, if you're in containers, like you were saying, take the container to them 
so that they can do it. It can survive without the ideal sun conditions for a week or however long you're out of town. Or the um, different irrigation opportunities are out there now with drip hoses and things you can set up on a timer. Absolutely. Yeah. What, so what has worked? You getting it to a neighbor? I have a, I have a neighbor who's very reliable, with it, but you know, you have to explain to them ahead of time. You can't just, the day you're getting ready to go out of town, say, would you come over and want one of my yards? Yeah, well, you wouldn't leave your kids with somebody and not tell them what to do. So <laughs> yeah, to and, and, and I wouldn't plant in containers if, you know, if I didn't think that I would have that backup. And the other thing is, if, if you uh, are going to try to grow tomatoes and, and things that require a lot of water, don't put them in a three-gallon pot because uh, that's about five times a day you've got to water. So, yeah. Uh, you got to plan ahead in that regard too. Before yeah. You plan. So be smart, but at, at the same time, for individuals, somebody who may not have a um, option, to me, a uh, sort of okay pot is a, of a plant is better than no pot at all, because sometimes you need that friend. <laughs> and um, if it, that's your buddy, and you're going to get out of bed because you want to take care of this plant, then you may be willing to go out there and, and water it. Well, it also helps if you share the. Exactly. Exactly. I had a, I hired a teenager, and they couldn't wait to come over and do it. It was so much fun because I told them they could pick flowers, and so every time they came over to water, they took Mama some flowers. Aww. So it was a great way, and they also fed my birds. And if you do that, tell them how much to put in. <laughs> I mean, I came back. And they, anyway, we used about half of a few pound bag, <laughs> but whatever, they did it, they had a wonderful time. And sharing, like you said, sharing the bounty made the her just thrill. Yeah. And yeah. the person that helped you may become a gardener because of what you asked them to help you with. Well, her father was an extension agent. She was a gardener because she never she, probably, she might have taken better care than I would. If anybody's ever been one of Free Arthur's uh, lecture. She always brings one of her uh, neighborhood kids with her. And he is the most enthusiastic gardener. He does all her grunt work for her. Yeah. It's amazing, you know. Well, and I want to call that out. Um, if you're out there in your yard or where somebody else can see you and you kind of see it, strike up conversation. I had a neighbor who unfortunately left um, some neighbors. And I kid you not, their 10-year-old uh, daughter was one of my dearest best friends. And she used to come out there and garden with me. At one point, it was five hours. And she loved it. I mean, they, people get engaged in it when they don't, you know, they're like, oh, she's out there having fun. She's out there every day. It must be okay. <laughs> so you never know who you can impact and who you can introduce to a very therapeutic activity. Got her PhD in horticulture, was riding on her seventh anniversary a bicycle, and her husband went ahead of her, and they heard a crack, and Rosemarie Rosetti was under that tree, and paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, she has developed a program that is taught to landscape architects, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I will try to get her current email and share it with others because she has put together a lot of things for uh, the differently abled yeah. gardener and homemaker. She's now, because of the wheelchair, under four feet tall and her husband is six six, I believe. <laughs> and they probably both want to use the same things. Yeah, so um, uh, a lot of times the people who have spent their life helping other people, uh, when they end up being in that role is uh, when they actually end up having the most impact. Because uh, they, they know uh, how to help themselves and they do it, and which helps other people. Okay, we gotta let them eat, but is there anybody else who wanted to add anything real quick? All right, well, I appreciate it. I honestly didn't know if anybody was going to be here. I was just like, I just hope I'll sit and talk to Chris. But um, I appreciate it. This is a passion, and um, if anybody ever wants to get involved, let the Master Gardeners know, and we'll, we'll get you somewhere. Yeah, can I say one thing else? Uh, people from the yard, we have been able to probably know that we have, uh, in the back of the trial gardens now, we have a large vegetable garden uh, for 
educating children. They have classes in cooking and they come and pick their own vegetables and this sort of thing. So if you're out of the arbor and you haven't seen it in the uh, very back of the trial garden, there's what we call the yurt, which is a the yurt. The yurt. 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 Is that like the yeah. it's quite a building. It's a classroom just for the children. Uh, yes. Awesome. And then there's all kinds of vegetables planted around that. Give them a chance to see what their food looks like growing. Really. <laughs> and they'll always take donations for educating children from lower income neighborhoods. Thank you so much, Rippy.